is passive stance awareness in psychology. It's just understanding how to posture in order to not increase the situation and the violence. And we tell people that in a street fight, and this is a stance that is widely used across the world. I didn't create it, and anybody tells you they created it, they're lying because it's been around since like the 13th century. Uh, as far as my research shows show me, the earliest time it was used is I think 13th century Keystone Cops. And they would approach perps to show them that they're unarmed and not a threat. They did this. They would, hey, I'm unarmed. That's what cops do when they enter a building or hostage negotiators. Uh, uh, you yell at a woman in Finland who's standing behind the counter at McDonald's because she shortchanged you and she's going to get her hands up like this. It doesn't matter where you go in the world. It's a universal symbol for, hey man, I don't want any problems. I, I'm passive. I want to discuss this. And so the important thing behind that is to understand that 60, roughly 60% 60 of communication is body language, 30% tone of voice, 10% words we use. And so if we understand that, to adopt a passive stance with aggressive behavior becomes counterproductive. It doesn't make sense. It just doesn't fucking jive. Part of you is lying. And that's the part that's going to ring truest to your opponent. Because like I said, if 60% of communication is body language and 30% is tone of voice, then your passive stance is going to automatically shift into an aggressive posture without you even knowing it because intentionally your words and your dialogue is going to be aggressive. Stay away. Back up. No, I don't want any trouble. Stand your ground. Don't come any closer. These are the worst things you can do. Because again, my posture is turning from this to this. Now this says I'm gonna fight, but this says I don't wanna fight. This says I'm scared. And you're not freezing in that posture. This is critical to understand is you don't do this and back up in a straight line, blah, 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 waiting to hit the guy whenever you want. Though you can, because you will be able to hit the guy whenever you want. That's the beauty of it. But there's a danger to that, is that if I do this, there might be somebody standing behind me who might grab me because I'm going in a linear fashion. If I keep my hands up like that without moving them, then that becomes incongruous, and he's gonna pick up on that, and he's gonna slap my hands out of the way, and get your fucking hands out of the way, and shut me, and keep going with his assault. And so it's important that when the hands come up, you use them, uh, I think Jeff Thompson calls it talking hands. And so what you're actually doing is you're using your hands to talk and go, hey man, I'm really sorry if I did anything wrong, no problem, we can discuss this. Whatever the dialogue is based on what he's saying. Now by doing this, I'm doing many different things. It's not just moving around for the sake of moving around because I'm nervous. There's actually a strategy to this. There's tactics to this. I am actually doing several things. I am setting my opponent up for a shot if I need to preempt him. One that he'll never see coming, that's one. Two, I'm giving him a legal, moral, and ethical opportunity to walk, to not get into a fight with me. Because I'm not going to challenge him. There's four things you never want to do when you get into an aggressive situation. You don't want to challenge your opponent. You don't want to threaten your opponent. You don't want to command your opponent. And you don't want to insinuate your opponent is wrong. You do one of these things and you're raising the situation. Even when you're having an argument with a loved one that is not violent, if you do one of these four things during that argument, you're gonna escalate the argument. They're not gonna stab you or kill you, hopefully, because they're your loved ones, but you're gonna see that the argument is not gonna get resolved. You're probably gonna part pissed off at each other, and oh, fuck, fine, yeah, fine, yeah, whatever. And you're not gonna talk for the next three, four hours because you're not settling anything, you're escalating and you're not seeing eye to eye, you're not trying to have any kind of empathy and understand where the other person is coming from. Now, I'm not saying to have empathy for the guy in the street who's threatening you, because at that point it's a little late for that, but you need to understand where they're coming from, and I think it's Musashi who said that, know your enemy, or Sun Tzu, or one of the two brothers, I fucking don't know, but somebody out there, a great philosopher, said something to the extent of, know thy enemy and you will win a thousand battles. Well, know thy enemy means that I need to understand what what triggers my opponent? If I say something that's gonna make him more aggressive and fight back, well, I don't wanna say these things. I wanna calm him down. I wanna raise his guard and drop his ego. And if I can do that, then I can get him to walk okay and make him go fuck no problem and leave. And like I said on a moral and ethical level, don't become what it is you're trying to defend against. Establish what kind of individual is fucking with you because sometimes it's a good person who's having a bad day as opposed to a sinister prick who wants to mess you up. It's not always. Sometimes life puts two people head to head, faces <coughs> us together, and at odds. But it doesn't mean we have to kill each other. It, you know, if, if we just listen sometimes, you'll find that most of the time, there's a saying in our industry that goes, those who talk can be persuaded to walk. 
And most of the time, if this guy's in front of you, mouthing off and shoving you, that's because he or she is not ready or mentally prepared to hit you yet. And if they're not mentally prepared to hit you yet and they're looking for a reason, you sure as hell don't want to give it to them, do you? It doesn't make sense. This guy wants to hit me. Now, what do I do? Do I encourage it? <laughs> or do I diffuse it? Hmm, what's the wisest thing? And so, for me, it's not encouraging it. It's trying to talk my way out of it. And making sure that if there are witnesses who are going to turn around when there is a commotion, where they're really and clearly going to see that I'm trying to get out of the situation. And as I said, by moving around as such, I'm establishing many different things. Now, if he's shoving me and he's saying, I'm going, hey, brother, what's up, how are you doing, man? Hey, brother, what's up, how are you doing? Oh, fuck you, hey, hey, piece of shit, come. Dude, I'm really sorry. Fuck, is there that fucking tummy? No, sorry, man. Hey, fucking sitting over there, fucking mouthing off the fuck. No, dude, I wasn't trying to mouth off. Oh, you fucking oh, dude, I wasn't even, can you stop that? Now, I, I hear him because he, he, he missed my hair. <laughs> but what I'm doing is just by moving around like that, I'm not just, I'm not just scared and, you know, you'll have nervous energy, so it's normal to shift and talk and go, hey, bro, use that energy to your advantage. I'm doing, like I said, several things. Giving him a, 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 an opportunity to walk. Two, does he have friends that I can't see? Well, if he's got friends waiting for me back here and I just do this or I stand my ground, well, I can still get hit by me from behind. But if he's shoving me and I'm moving around and I'm breaking my rhythm as I'm talking to him and I'm doing this, well, I'm establishing now situational and environmental awareness. And he doesn't know I'm doing this out of strategy, but I need to do this before I preempt. Because if I preempt too early, I could be in a world of shit. He comes up, hey, da da da. No, fuck you, yeah, bang! I knock him out, three of his fans stand up. Uh-oh. What do I do? At that point, I go, guys, I'm really sorry. Your buddy decided to break his face on my fist. I don't know why. Um, wasn't young. It's not going to work. They won't believe that. And so at that point, it becomes important to be able to determine what's going on situationally and environmentally. And the only way you'll be able to do that is by establishing it and looking around. And you can't look around by doing this either. Hey, man, no any problems, but you got friends in anyone? No? Yeah, but if you, because you're going to get hit. You can't take your even when you bow, <laughs> right? And so be careful. A little Bruce Lee reference, anyone at that? Yeah, a couple of people smiled, you know what I'm saying. And so you gotta be careful not to, not to do that, and you gotta learn how to diffuse your vision. And we're gonna be doing a bunch of that stuff tomorrow. Today we're concentrating on other things. And also what I'm doing is I'm making myself a much harder target. I mean, if he wanted to sucker punch me at any time, it becomes a shitload easier doing it if I'm just standing here going, hey man, I don't want any problems, blah, 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 blah. Then that fist can come out, no problem, because I'm stable. But if I'm moving around, it becomes a lot harder for him to actually throw that punch. And if he does want to throw it, he's going to telegraph it from a mile. Because just by moving, you're shifting yourself out of what we're referring to as his power box. That your opponent does prior to actually landing anything on you is highly telegraphic. It's just that most people don't know how to look or what to look for. And this is where they get caught by surprise. It's down to the point where, just to give you an idea about the adrenal stress condition phase and how it functions is that when we perceive threat or danger, we go through the adrenaline, uh, the adrenaline gets shot through the system <coughs> and so forth. So what happens is auditory perception gets shot by 70%. So does eyesight. I mean, most of the time we go into tunnel vision, which is why they say that even law enforcement officers and uh, uh, trained soldiers, high caliber soldiers, don't see a weapon coming out in a real fight. Blade comes out, we don't see it because of the adrenal stress condition phase a lot of times. And so if this happens, aside from a whole bunch of other physiological, physiological changes, you're going to start to feel your stomach tightening a little bit. One of your legs is going to start to shake. You're going to see it in your pants, too. It's funny because it's, if you've ever had that, you realize that. You know, <laughs> and your hands start to tremble. Your, your breath goes a little bit more shallow. At that particular moment, you can't access fine motor skills any longer. So the majority of martial arts techniques are not accessible because all of those fine motor skill <laughs> martial arts techniques are stored in the cerebral cortex, the frontal lobe of the brain. And they're only accessible when we have clarity in the moment, meaning that when we deem ourselves in a predatorial position, then we can access those tools because we don't feel threatened any longer. You're letting witnesses know you don't want to fight. If people turn around and go, what the fuck is going on there? And they see him mouthing off and they see me doing this and him shoving me and slapping me in the head and me going, fuck man, blah, blah, and then me fighting back, then it's clearly self-defense. Because cops, if they do show up at the end of the situation, they go, well, what did you guys see? Well, I saw this guy trying to beat the shit out of this guy, and this guy looked really, really scared. The other guy hit him a few times, and then this guy just fucking went to town on him. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so that's a clear-cut case of self-defense.